It was the middle of May, and the weather was unusually hot for spring. Despite the heat, the golf course remained unaffected. There was thick green grass, and the whole landscape looked more like a toy course than a real landscape. The course was filled with small plains, hollows, and hills, with patches without grass, adding to the unique scenery. Here and there were groves of a few trees that created dense shadows. The three young men had been playing for about three hours, teasing each other. Didn't Nicole convince you to marry her this time? The tall man with blue eyes asked. I thought you would finally give in. Khalil, I think even if Dave is dragged to the wedding, he won't be able to handle it and will run away. He's a true runaway groom, the other man laughed. Well, it seems like you have no faith in me at all, Dave said, slightly offended. As he prepared to take his shot, he positioned himself, shifted his weight, and slung the club with precision, sending the ball rolling into the hole. I guess your form has improved after the break. What were you doing with Nicole? Khalil winked at his friend. Perhaps he was playing golf with her, said James, laughing. And probably he did so every night. I envy you, Dave. You're a free man, no wife, no children. Although I have to give her credit, Nicole is the only one who has managed to stay with you for about a year. That's a record. Dave looked at Khalil. If I marry her, then I'll be like you, suffering in agony because maybe my wife is not my soulmate. Come on, Khalil replied resentfully, as he struck the ball with a powerful stroke and sent it into the hole. That was a long time ago. Lillian and I didn't even have children back then, and now I couldn't be happier. We know you're completely under her control, James laughed. It's surprising she hasn't called you yet, considering how pathologically jealous she is of all your friends. Yeah, I told her I was going for a massage and asked her not to bother me for two hours. Khalil sighed. You're right about that. She sees you as a threat. As soon as she finds out I was with both of you, she starts lecturing me about how you're not serious and how I should stay away from you. As for Dave, that's obvious. But what's wrong with me? asked surprised James. Your wives, Khalil replied, annoyance evident in his voice. You've already changed three women in the past seven years. But it's not my fault that they leave me? James said resentfully. As soon as they've had their fill of my money, they drained my account and then disappeared. But I got lucky with Julie. I intentionally married a girl from the countryside. She loves me so much that she dotes on me. She doesn't need diamonds, expensive clothes or cars. Our house is filled with servants. However, when I come home, she's either cleaning the house or baking her special apple pie. The only bad thing is that I really want children, but the doctor says there's still no improvement. James, why don't you go abroad? They treat infertility there. Dave patted his friend on the shoulder. You have enough money, so there shouldn't be any problems. Dave, I've already looked into it. The man sighed. They suggested I start a course in the fall. I'll be going in October. Of course, go. Khalil supported him. You're only forty so you still have plenty of time to have children with Julie. Although I have to admit, I'm so tired of them. Sometimes Lillian hints that we should have another one, but I finally told her, Enough! Why do we need more? We already have three. Children are a blessing, Dave said and laughed. Khalil, think twice. You'll have a whole soccer team. I can already imagine the headlines in the newspapers. The wife of the famous millionaire is pregnant, with their eleventh child. God forbid. Khalil drops the club from his hands in fright. Do you want me dead? Yeah, Dave is not only without kids, but also without a wife, and he's lecturing us on how to live. James teased Dave. After four hours, the friends finished playing and tiredly headed to the restaurant. Khalil, Dave and James had been friends for many years. Guys, let's go fishing, James suggested suddenly. I'm tired of the city, and it'll be a chance of scenery. The fishing season is opening soon. 
If it's just for a little while, I agree. Khalil supported his friend and looked at Dave, who stayed silent. Why are you looking at me like that? Sorry, but I can have some other plans. Dave got angry, finally. Now, you will say again that I'm ruining our friendship. What a scoundrel I am. Yes, you are exactly that, laughed James. You are our eternal troublemaker. So what excuse are you planning this time? Well, I've met a girl. The man began and paused. No, again? The friends exclaimed in unison. Dave, you already have a whole collection of women. What about Nicole? Well, Nicole is one. But don't I have to explore other options? He said arrogantly. And besides, you've already found your one and only. Well, I'm not sure about Nicole. Well, to prevent that from happening, we'll fly on a fishing trip in June, James said sternly. All right, you've convinced me, Dave said unhappily. You'll leave me alone now, won't you? He muttered under his breath. The friends had a good time at the golf club restaurant and then headed home. Katie, hi, Dave dialed a number. How are you? What are you doing today? I'm shopping, the voice on the other end replied tiredly. My sister's wedding is in a week, so I'm getting ready. I'm glad to hear, the man replied cheerfully. So, after such a good day, why don't we go to a cafe? All right, let's do it, the girl said. Dave's friends were right. He had a whole collection of girlfriends for every occasion. Nicole was still considered the main contender for the role of his wife. Katie was the girl he had recently met. Helen was the only one of his old flames. They were more like friends, but occasionally they managed to have an interesting, romantic evening. In fact, he himself didn't know how many girls he had been with in his life. At first he thought he must be some kind of womanizer, but over time he realized that it wasn't the case. He could be loyal and faithful, but he simply hadn't met the right girl yet. Lately, he had begun to understand James. Many women were after his fortune. Even Nicole and Dave knew it very well. Deep down, he envied his friends and desperately wanted a family and children, but there was no suitable women around him. Dave was only 35, so he didn't lose hope. In the evening, he got in his car and went to meet Katie. I'm so happy to see you, Katie's eyes sparkled. I'm sorry, I've been busy for the past few days, so we couldn't meet. That's okay. The important thing is that we're together today. He took her hand. You didn't tell me your sister was getting married. Honestly, I even forgot. There's been so much going on. My sister is very lucky because she's marrying a businessman. I'm so happy for her. Now she'll have a big house, her own car, and everything she wants. The girl sighed dreamily. Unfortunately, I'm not so lucky. Why? Dave said with surprise. You're only 23. What are you talking about? That's the thing. I don't want an ordinary man. I know my worth. Katie looked at him intently. Don't worry. I have no doubt that a girl like you will definitely be appreciated. He winked at her. Many wealthy men are looking for decent women. And what about you? Katie suddenly asked. What kind of woman do you need? I haven't figured that out yet, Dave admitted honestly. Looks can be deceiving. Everyone eventually grows old, so she must have a beautiful soul. Do you think it matters? The girl laughed. No one has ever seen any soul after all. It's all imaginary. We only live once, so we should live life beautifully. Katie really wanted to go to Dave's house, but he made up a story about having to go to the hospital to visit his uncle. It's the same thing again, he scolded himself as he drove home. It's as if she's being auctioned off at the market. Unfortunately, the bidding for her today didn't go well, he laughed. James was right. After so many years of unsuccessful relationships with fortune hunters, he married a simple girl. Julie is really crazy about him, and everyone knows it. Dave remembered how they had met her by chance. It was three years ago. 
Dave and his friends were fishing in the distant region. On the way, it started to rain heavily, and even their jeep got stuck. They reached a village and asked for help. An old man sent them to Julie. She'll get you out, the old man said. The men looked at each other uncertainly, but decided to follow the old man's advice. A tall, tanned young woman opened the door. Oh, you're in trouble, she shook her head. All right, wait here. I'll get you out. The friends stood in shock as Julie drove her tractor out of the gate. Show me the way, she shouted through the rain and drove towards their stuck car. What a woman, James exclaimed in amazement as Julie pulled their jeep out of the mud. She is certainly strong. I bet she might stop a horse at a gallop said Dave with a smile. But the story didn't end there. The woman invited the guests for tea and treated them to her speciality cake. James fell in love with her right away. James, what are you doing? His friends scolded him. She's a country girl. You know nothing about women. The man took offence. Julie will be mine and that's final. Three months later, they got married it had been many years, and James still loved his wife. Later, when they all got together, Dave often listened to her affectionate words to James. James, honey, darling, my kitten, my dear heart. Julie literally showered him with love, and sincerity shone in her eyes. That's what I want, Dave thought, to be someone's beloved, not just a wallet. Dave returned home late, he had been living alone for a long time. As soon as his father gave him a share of the business, Dave separated himself from it. Dave's father had been involved in the production of tableware his whole life. He owned two large pottery and glass factories. Dave took over the stores. Dave sat down on the sofa and closed his eyes. He could forget about everything with his friends, but at home, loneliness overwhelmed him. He reached for the phone. Hi, Mum. Dave pronounced. How are you doing? How's Dad? I'll probably come and visit you one of these days. Hi, son, the mother replied cheerfully. Yes, we're fine. Sure, come over. We haven't seen you in a while. Your father will be very pleased. All right, let's do it on Sunday then, suggested the son and hung up the phone. The next week flew by and on Sunday, Dave drove to his parents' house. Hi, son, his father hugged him. How are you? It's been a long time since you've been here. I've already missed you. Dad, hi. You know I'm always busy. Dave excused himself. When are you going to introduce Nicole to us? His father said with annoyance in his voice. We are hoping that this time we will finally be lucky and have a daughter-in-law and then grandchildren. Well, don't start, please, Dave said grudgingly. I'm tired of this bachelor life myself. I also want a family, but so far, no one is suitable for this role. Even Nicole? The mother was surprised. I thought you two were serious. Even her? The son lowered his head. I'm not quite sure about her, Mum. You married Dad when he had nothing, but they all want to have everything at once. You're right about that, son, sighed the father. Your mother went through so much with me, and you can't even imagine the debts we had then. That's what I'm saying, Dave scratched his head. And if I go bankrupt tomorrow or get sick, what then? Goodbye, love? Dave, why don't you try getting acquainted with someone on the internet, advised the mother. Maybe you'll get lucky there. Mum, do you know what kind of ads are on there? He laughed. For example, I'm looking for a man for a serious relationship and family, with harmless habits, and to be well off. I'm agreed to relocate. Well, let them write it plainly. I want to marry a rich man without any problems. He must provide for me. I won't work. Only spend his money. At least that would be honest. Well, come on. I'll show you something, the father said mysteriously, and took his son by the hand. They walked through the garden and headed towards a large lawn. It was obvious that work was still being done there. Wow, you're going to have a miniature golf course now, laughed the son. Many years ago, Dave's father tried golf for the first time, and it was love at first swing. 
he passed on this passion to his son, who had already infected his friends with it. Yes, and I've already tried it, agreed the father. I want to practice the most difficult shots at different angles, so that later on the big field, in any situation, this skill will be immediately activated. That day, parents and son talked a lot, discussing business, health and plans. Well, Mum, Dad, I was very pleased to see you. Dave hugged his parents goodbye. It's good at your place. It's not boring, he sighed. Son, yes, if you like, move in with us, his father suggested to him for the umpteenth time, and we'll have more fun. Dad, thank you, but I'm so used to my loneliness that I can't live with anyone any more, Dave answered honestly. I love you very much, but I'm so used to it. Dave jumped into the car and drove home. It was already evening. He had work tomorrow, and he was planning to go to the office, but the weather was so nice that he decided to go for a little drive. Dave stopped the car not far from Central Square. People were walking, and Dave also walked around. Suddenly, he noticed a crowd aside. He walked nearer and heard someone's voice, which he thought was a child's. He made his way through the crowd and saw a girl. She looked to be about ten years old. Her eyes were half-closed, and she was reading something loudly. Is she reciting someone else's poetry, or what? Thought Dave, and listened. I do not remember such. Maybe one of the modern authors? The girl read another poem, and people started dropping coins into the box in front of her. Wonderful poems, pronounced an elderly man. Bravo! The girl became embarrassed and lowered her head. She was dressed in an old sweater and faded pants. Her hair was braided into two pigtails and looked unwashed for a long time. After thanking everyone, she fumbled with her hands for a box, picked up a stick and walked away. Is she homeless or what? ran through Dave's head. However, she is going somewhere. Probably she has a place to live. Dave didn't really want to think about the little girl, so he quickly stepped aside and walked around the square some more. He had almost walked to his car when his phone rang. Hello, honey, Nicole's voice sounded. Aren't we going to see each other today? Nicole, hi, he said tiredly. Let's do it tomorrow. I've been busy all day today and I'm exhausted. Dave, I miss you so much she said capriciously. You're always busy for me. Nicole, we flew back from Dubai only a week ago. He got angry. That's why I have things to catch up on right now. All right, don't get angry. See you tomorrow, she said playfully. I'll be looking forward to seeing you. The next day was a very busy one. He didn't really want to meet Nicole because he was actually exhausted but she had insisted. "'Don't you love me at all?' she cried fake tears, sitting across him at the restaurant. "'I miss you so much, but you don't care about me.' "'Nicole, come on,' Dave said angrily. "'I've got so many duties. Do you think business works itself out?' "'Dave, how about I move in with you?' Nicole said cautiously. "'If we love each other, why do we have to live at a distance?' The man looked at her and said, Nicole, I understand everything, but I'm not ready for that yet. But will it be bad for you? She persisted. Like a faithful wife, I will wait for you at home to surround you with care and love every day. Honey, I love you. Darling, why do you need to create all these problems? He tried to change the subject. Once you move in with me, Unnecessary worries will start. We might start quarrelling, and you don't want to be apart from me, right? Of course not. Nicole looked at him shrewdly. I love you so much. I can't bear to be away from you. Let's leave things as they are. Why do we need all this trouble? The man said tiredly. No, Dave. I want to be sure of your serious intentions. Nicole got angry. Choose. Either you propose to me, or I'm leaving. Saying this, the woman stood up defiantly. 
I'm sorry, but I can't right now, Dave replied. Why all this drama? Without any words, Nicole turned around and went away. Dave sat a little longer in the cafe and called the waiter. He didn't like this whole situation. Maybe it's better for both of us, he sighed and left the cafe. He had grown accustomed to Nicole, and it saddened him to part ways with her, but he no longer wanted to continue this charade. How about taking a train ride? Dave suggested when they next met with friends. Dave, are you kidding? Maybe you're also suggesting that we go by car? Khalil got angry. Don't you have enough romance? Khalil, why are you so angry today? James looked at him in surprise. Did something happen to you? It's all because of you, Khalil muttered. You've made a prophecy. I wish you would just stay quiet. What happened? Tell us finally, Dave asked. Lillian is pregnant again, Khalil exclaimed. It's all because of you and your soccer team jokes. Khalil, that's great, congratulations, James rejoiced. What a fool you are. You have such happiness. And by the way, why are you worrying anyway? Dave laughed. You have plenty of money. Your children don't starve. They're all taken care of by governesses. Do you know how noisy they are? The man persisted. You can't escape from them. There are ten rooms in the house, and they're everywhere. Well, that's true. They need to run and jump. James laughed. Don't you play with them? I do, replied the friend angrily, but not for twelve hours a day. I come home tired from work, and it's like a real menagerie. I don't know how the poor governesses and my wife handle them. I can only dream of such a thing, said James sadly. How I long for children. I wouldn't say no, even to four. When Lillian gives birth, I'll give the baby to you, scolded Khalil. Okay, that's all clear. Let's return to our topic. How are we going to get to the fishing trip? asked Dave. Of course, by airplane, said the friends in unison. Romance will be on the lake and in the wild forest. So the tickets were purchased and the day of departure has arrived. Almost late, puffed Khalil, greeting his friends. Hi, by the way, I've been pondering a question. What if Lillian is having twins? Dave laughed. Dave, shut your mouth, Khalil shouted. When you open it, everything comes true, so please have some mercy for your old friend. You must have almost missed our plane, because Lillian refused to let you go fishing, James laughed. She, you see, wanted, the man said angrily. God, I've even forgotten what this stuff is called. What do the pregnant usually want? Probably pickles or oranges, James laughed. No, my wife needs artichokes, Khalil said angrily. She's never eaten an artichoke in her life, or even seen one. And now I have to bring her one or die. I was running around the stores like a fool. They were laughing at me, and she was hysterical. Well, then it definitely points to twins. Dave tried to speak seriously, but he couldn't stand it and burst into loud laughter. Shut up! Khalil shouted at him. If we do have twins, I'll leave them at your door, and you can be their foster father. Dave, I propose to share them in that case. James intervened. One for you, one for me. Four hours later, the friends were already in the wild lands, ready for their fishing. They planned to fish in the lake, and then go to the river which flowed into the sea. If it weren't for these mosquitoes, Khalil grumbled, I would have escaped from Lillian here, but it makes no difference whether she eats me at home, or they'll eat me here. But here, you'll die a hero, Dave laughed. We'll give you a posthumous award with an inscription. Honour and glory to a father of many children. You're at it again, the man said angrily. I'm going to put you on the hook now. I assure you, I'm so nasty that not even the fish will bite me. Dave kept joking. 
No problem. We'll have to come up with something more tricky for you, Khalil muttered. I'll take your clothes off and tie you to a tree. You'll make a great treat for mosquitoes. It's not going to work, Dave replied. Have you forgotten that all women are crazy about me? By the way, only women mosquitoes bite, but they'll kiss me. They'll eat you alive, James taunted. Your flirting won't work with these. In such a merry mood, the friends spent three unforgettable days. They had one more day ahead when Dave's phone rang. Dave, why didn't you call me all this time? Nicole said through her tears. Didn't you say we were parting? The man said, perplexed. I can't live without you, she cried. I love you. Can we meet now? Well, I'm actually not at home, he answered calmly. We're on a fishing trip far away. And when will you be back? Nicole asked hopefully. Please come to me right away. We fly back tomorrow night, Dave replied. Let's meet the day after tomorrow. After that conversation, Khalil and James looked at Dave attentively. Probably all this time, she was calculating your millions and realised that she couldn't let go of such a goldfish. James sighed. At first I thought it was just bad luck with my first wife, but when my second wife turned out to be the same, I started to think. So, when I married the third one, I only had a hope, which, of course, didn't come true. Are they all like that? Dave exclaimed angrily. But somewhere out there are women like Lillian and Julie. Why am I so unlucky? Dave calmed down. Khalil patted him on the shoulder. Your time will come, and you'll find your happiness. Maybe it'll be a woman you never thought of, but once you fall in love with her, you won't want to live without her. Is that even possible? Dave said quietly. I really want to love like that, but I can't. Maybe I can't love at all. Come on, it's all nonsense, Khalil encouraged his friend. It's just that you're surrounded by female hunters. Look for ordinary women. You know, it seems to me that even a little girl at the age of ten dreams of riches. If you give them money, they'll spend it all in a month and then ask for more. I don't agree with you, James objected. Not all girls are the same. Here, if you like, we can even bet. Dave jumped up. I'll find someone, even the most ordinary or beggar and I bet that she'll spend all the money at once. OK, Khalil stretched out his hand. Let's make a bet. How much money are you willing to give? Let it be a hundred thousand. Dave's eyes glittered. If you win, you give me a new car. And if I lose, then... Then this very month you'll get married, James offered. Do you agree? All right. Dave laughed, but if I lose, which I doubt very much, I'll choose my future wife myself. It's a deal, Khalil said. When we get back, we'll start right away. We'll have some fun. Be sure that even a little girl can't resist my money, Dave winked at him. Probably you should offer the money to Nicole, James laughed. With her, you won't lose for sure. No, Nicole doesn't count the man protested. For the purity of the experiment, we'll choose an outsider. I'll have to think about that for a while. Dave was eager to rest after his return, but that same evening he received a call from Nicole, and they agreed that he would come to her house tomorrow at lunchtime. Dave! Honey! Nicole ran out to meet him. Hurry, come in, I've been waiting for you. She looked wonderful. It was evident that she had put in significant effort wearing a revealing dress and making a stunning hairstyle. There was wine on the table and delicious appetizers. Well, here's to reconciliation, Nicole said joyfully and poured wine into glasses. Nicole, I'm driving. Besides, I won't be long. I have to leave in a few minutes. Nicole was wary. She couldn't let him go and tried her best seduction techniques. It seemed to her that she had almost succeeded but suddenly Dave's phone rang. Yes, I'll be there soon, 
he answered someone. Nicole, I'm sorry. I have a little emergency at work. Oh, damn it! The woman shouted in rage when he had left. You're not getting away from me! I'll have you, Dave! Nicole had put in so much effort to ensnare Dave that she realised that it wouldn't be easy with him. Nicole had almost married a wealthy man before, but her friend took him away from her. Over the years, she had become more calculating and acted cautiously. But Dave was a challenge. With him, she had to play the game of love for so long that she grew tired of it. She hoped that after the ultimatum, Dave would come to her and finally propose wholeheartedly that she was mistaken. Don't worry, you won't escape from me. Her eyes gleamed with serious intention. I promise you that. Dave hurried out of Nicole's apartment and quickly ran to his car. He started the engine and lightly pressed on the gas. Thank God Khalil called me, he rejoiced. Otherwise I might have fallen for her fish road. And I don't want that any more. Dave was just driving around town, and at one place he parked his car. He got out and walked down the street. He didn't even notice how he found himself in a familiar square. Suddenly, he noticed the same lonely girl reciting someone's poems. Who wrote this? Dave couldn't help asking. The girl was embarrassed and didn't answer. She took a deep breath and started reciting again. It's strange, the man thought to himself. Maybe she's deaf, too. He stood there a little longer. The poems were truly heart-wrenching, with both pain and beauty in them. The man dropped a few bills into the donation box. I wonder what she would do with big money, he thought. Bingo! I'll give her the money. I'm sure she'll spend it all in a month. Yes, that's it. I'll definitely win that bet. He laughed. On the weekend, the friends gathered at Dave's father's house to play golf. So, how's Lillian? Dave asked amidst his laughter. Did she like the artichokes? Laugh all you want, Khalil pouted. They actually turned out to be delicious. She took a bite and wanted to throw them away. The artichoke craze has passed, but I ended up eating them with great pleasure. But now we have another problem. She wants durian. Ooh, it's so stinky. Ooh, James shuddered. I wanted to try it once in Taiwan, but as soon as I smelled it, I almost threw up. Yeah, I've told her all that, but she still wants it, and that's it, the man exclaimed in frustration. I even tried forbidding her from watching all those cooking and travel channels, but it's impossible. I'm afraid to even think about what she'll ask for next. Yeah, her taste preferences are really strange this time. James said bewilderedly. Maybe she should eat anchovies, olives, crab, or whatever else pregnant women might want. Oh, she even eats habanero peppers without bread, Khalil said in horror. I'm shocked. Khalil, it's definitely twins and boys, Dave teased his friend. All the men laughed, and then Dave continued. Guys, I want to talk about our bet. I'm going to give money to a poor girl, She's probably about ten or eleven years old. She looks like a beggar. Well, then you'll win for sure, Khalid waved his hand. It would be better for Nicole. She would spend that right away, he laughed. Let it be so. James supported his friend. On the contrary, if she had never had money, she didn't know what to do with it, and will win. I agree. Oh, how unlucky Nicole is. Khalil did not persist, and she had severe pains for you, by the way, but you've spoiled it all. Yes, she wanted to seduce me the other day, Dave exclaimed indignantly. If it wasn't for you, Khalil, she would have definitely succeeded. Thank you for calling in time. As the round came to an end, the sun was already slipping towards sunset. The friends went home satisfied, having had a great time. Well, how are you going to give her the money? Khalil asked curiously as he got into his car. Yes, she might think we're some kind of crooks. We need to find a way to approach her, but not in a deceitful manner, Dave said calmly. I'll tell her 
that I want to help her, that I've been listening to her poems for a long time and that I like them. Let's approach her together first and then we'll decide. It was Sunday and people were walking around. Considering the danger of giving such money to a little girl, the friends decided to assess the situation first before deciding. Then, slowly, approached the square, where a few people were already standing and attentively listening to the child. The performance is really impressive. Probably one of the classics, Khalil whispered. Yeah, and she has a powerful voice that pierces the skin, James said. The beggar girl recited a few more verses before stopping. Someone clapped, and after expressing gratitude, they threw money into the box. The girl reached for water, took a small sip and rested. Well, that won't work, James finally said. We should find out where she goes in the evening. Instead of giving her a bag full of money in public, let's follow her to her house or wherever she goes and give her the money there. That way, no one takes them from her. Yes, you're right, Dave agreed. What should we do now? Hang around here until tonight? She left around eight last time, but it's only six now. Well, let's wait, Khalil sighed. It's a bet. I don't even want to go home. Lillian is there with her tantrums, and the kids are screaming. For now, let's go to a cafe, Dave suggested. We'll return at seven o'clock. She'll still be here. The man left the girl and went to a nearby cafe. Over a cup of coffee, they reminisced about how they had met, laughing at funny stories from their lives. It was almost seven when they returned to the square. However, the girl had gone away. Oh, damn, Dave cursed. The girl left early today. What do we do now? If she had known what awaited for her, she would have waited for us here until morning, he said arrogantly. What about our plan B? Khalil sighed. Nicole definitely won't refuse. Forget her, Dave scolded. She already has everything. She just doesn't want to work. She wants to live an all-inclusive life. I'd rather help this child. The friends decided to try their luck again the next day. By six o'clock, they were already at the square. This time, they parked the car closer. The men got out and listened to the poems the child was reading for about half an hour. Then she picked up her box and, feeling her way with a stick, hurried off to the side. Let's follow her, whispered James. But be careful. Blind people have excellent hearing. They cautiously followed the girl, but nevertheless she heard their footsteps behind her. There are several of them, she thought. Where can I run away? If anything happens, I'll scream. She hoped that the people would turn the other way, but they continued to follow her. Then Audrey thought, Whatever happens, it's better for these people to take everything from her here than to find out where she and Rebecca lived. Therefore, she suddenly stopped and asked anxiously, Who are you? Why are you following me? See, I've told you, James hissed. Girl, don't be afraid. We won't harm you. We want to help you. We were just afraid to give you money in the crowded square, he explained. The men approached the little girl, who trembled with fear and clutched her box to her chest. Please don't touch me, she cried. If you want, take the money. We don't want anything from you, Khalil tried to calm the girl. We wanted to give you the money ourselves. We want to help you. We just didn't want anyone to notice. Here, take it. Dave held out a bag of money. Just to be careful and hide it at home. You'll have enough for food and clothes. We are wealthy people, so it won't cost us anything. The little beggar nervously shifted her hands. She felt the bag she was given, said, Thank you, and walked away. What's your name? Dave shouted after her. Do you have a name? Audrey. She paused for a second and quickly walked away. Oh, my goodness, I've never thought that I would be chasing someone to give them money. 
James wiped his face. It's already the other way around. Yes, an indescribable experience, Dave agreed. And I feel sorry for the child. She was so frightened that I wanted to hug her. Poor girl. Does she live alone? Maybe we should have accompanied her. You've seen how scared she was. I don't think she would have wanted that, James said with annoyance. It broke my heart. We live without any problems, not knowing any hardships, while she can't even afford bread. The friends returned in a sombre mood. On one hand, they felt like they had done a good deed, but on the other hand, they realised it wasn't just a game. The girl looked so pitiful that it stirred strong compassion in the friends, and they couldn't shake off the feeling for a long time. Guys, I want to follow her, Dave suddenly said. What if some gypsies are forcing her to beg, or if she has an abusive father? It's not about the money. I'm worried about the child now. Meanwhile, Audrey approached the house. She clutched her bag to her chest and hurried down the steps to the basement. Rebecca, she said quietly, look what's in this bag. Audrey, where did you get that? said her sister in amazement. There's money in here, lots of money. What happened? Today, I was chased by some people, the girl fearfully recounted. I realised from their voices that there were three of them. They were men. They were following me. I was very frightened because I thought they wanted to take my money. I decided to give it to them so they wouldn't find out where we lived. But when they approached me, they said they wanted to help me. One of them explained that they were afraid to give me the money in public because it could be stolen. The men apologised for scaring me, handed me this bag and left. They didn't ask you for anything? Her worried sister asked. Nothing, Audrey replied briefly. What should we do now? Let's wait for a while, the girl suggested. Maybe there are some bandits who decided to hide their money with us. Audrey, you should hide it in a secret place. If no one shows up in a month, then we can decide what to do with it. All right, her sister agreed. I'll hide it under the floorboards here. She opened their hiding spot, where they kept Rebecca's gold ring that their father had given her, along with a thousand dollars they had saved. Audrey, what were their voices like? Rebecca asked as they went to bed. Were they mean? You know, I was so scared that I didn't even think about it, Audrey answered. It seemed to me that one of them was younger. He had a very pleasant voice. Another was a little rough, but I also felt compassion and care from him. The third man sounded like a father. He was probably the oldest. He spoke to me as if I was his own child. I didn't sense any anger or anything bad from any of them. What does it all mean? She wondered and then said aloud, OK, let's get dinner and go to bed. It's getting late. You're already tired, aren't you? Rebecca, a child's voice called out, do you remember our mummy? Can you tell me a little about her? Audrey, mum was beautiful, Rebecca replied. She was waiting for you so much. Daddy and I went shopping to buy you clothes. I remember really liking one outfit. It had beautiful butterflies on a white blouse and pants. We all really wanted you. Did mummy see me when I was born? The little girl asked excitedly. Unfortunately, no, Rebecca sighed. She had fallen into a coma and never recovered. On the third day, Mum passed away. I wish I could have seen her, the child cried. But even if she were alive, I wouldn't be able to. Audrey, my dear sister, someday everything will change, and we will live in a big house again. She gently stroked the girl's head. Let's have faith in that, OK? Will we have a garden and swings there? Audrey began to dream. And I also want a dog and a cat. You will, you'll see, the girl said in a soothing voice. I have a feeling that one day you'll start seeing normally. And I would really like that, Audrey rejoiced. Otherwise, everything is just a blur in front of my eyes, and then suddenly almost darkness. It's like that all the time. Let's sleep, honey. Good night, Rebecca said, gently stroking her sister's hand. She closed her eyes and tears trickled down her cheeks. She realised that she should be happy because spring had arrived and things would be easier for them. But unlike Audrey, Rebecca was an adult and she knew that someday winter would come again and they would freeze from the cold once more. The girl remembered her mother and father. 
Rebecca, come on, hurry up, her father urged her, or you'll be late for school. Rebecca finished her breakfast with no enthusiasm, grabbed her backpack, and slowly made her way to the car. If only I didn't have to go to that stupid school then, she said resentfully. I could spend the whole day writing poetry. At the age of eight, a young genius awoke within Rebecca, and she tirelessly wrote all the time. At first, her parents didn't pay much attention to it, but one day, when her mother was cleaning her room and found her writing diary, the woman was shocked. Bernard, read this, she said in amazement. It's outstanding. The man took the notebook in his hands and began to read. His eyes widened more and more. He stopped and looked at his wife. Honey, she's got talent. How can a child write poetry like that? At the age of 15, Rebecca had already won many awards. Her parents didn't interfere. They did everything they could to nurture her talent in poetry. Rebecca was happy. The only thing she hated was school, or rather, certain teachers who tried to belittle her and devalue her talent. After graduation, Rebecca enrolled in the literature department of the university. She was in her third year when everything changed. At these thoughts, Rebecca finally fell into a deep sleep. Audrey woke up early. Despite her poor eyesight, she tidied up by touch, cleaned up after her sister, and prepared breakfast. The room was always dimly lit, and Rebecca lay near the small window because she needed the light to write. Audrey, how do you like this? she asked, and read a new quatrain. I want to finish it today, and tomorrow we'll teach it. It's beautiful, Rebecca, the girl smiled. You have beautiful poems in general. They make me want to cry at first, but then they bring me joy. There's a shining face of a father and caring hands of a mother in them. There's you and me. They had tea and bread, and after putting everything away, the little girl left their dwelling. If Audrey could see, she would be horrified by their living conditions. It was an old, dilapidated house that had been abandoned by its inhabitants seven years ago. Nothing had changed since then. Audrey and Rebecca lived in the basement. It was safe there, and the living rooms had broken windows, so it was warmer in the winter. The small window provided enough light for Rebecca to work. Surprisingly, they discovered that an electrical outlet, which served some technical purpose, still worked, allowing them to have hot tea. Once, Audrey found a teapot among the old unwanted items placed by the trash cans and brought it to Rebecca. The girl was overjoyed, because their second winter in this basement was easier with it. Meanwhile, Audrey took her stick and slowly made her way to the square. Many people loved her poems and the way she read them. If not for her poor eyesight, she and Rebecca could have collected enough money to rent an apartment a long time ago. However, Audrey was often stolen from, with people pretending to drop five dollars into her box and actually taking fifty or a hundred. In the local store, she was frequently deceived as well, so they barely had enough for bread and some other basic items. Audrey reached the square and felt the steps leading to the monument with her stick. She carefully climbed onto the platform, placed the box in front of her, and began to read. Despite her poor eyesight, she had learned to sense the presence of people over time, and she was never wrong. Today, she sensed several people had come up to her, and they had slipped some paper into her pocket. An hour later, thunder was heard and it was obvious the rain was imminent. The girl took her box and sought refuge in her hiding place, the basement of a nearby building. The door to the inside was closed, but the steps leading down there were under a canopy, protecting her from the rain. The first thuds against the plastic roof were heard, and within seconds a downpour began. Audrey listened attentively to the rain, imagining her mother's voice behind it. Rebecca tried her best to replace her mother, but being unable to walk, she couldn't provide all the care Audrey needed. Some day, I won't have to hide from the rain in old cellars, Audrey thought, because we'll have a home. Together with Rebecca, we will look out of the window and put our palms to the rain. The girl sighed. Her older sister said they had been homeless for over three years. Audrey hadn't realised how quickly time had passed. She vaguely remembered their house, but even then, her eyesight wasn't excellent. Eventually, her vision deteriorated, and the fragmented images in her eyes were replaced by almost darkness. She couldn't even remember her father's face, and there were only a few moments 
of his presence in her memories. The rain had stopped, and Audrey came out of her hiding place and wandered to the store. Please give me bread, four sausages and a cookie. She handed the money to the saleswoman. Here, take this. The older woman handed her the groceries. She quickly tucked a hundred-dollar bill into her pocket. Will I get change? The child held out her hand. There's not enough here as it is. I gave you sausages at my expense, said the saleswoman, contrived. The girl thanked her and left. She was already approaching the house when it started raining again. Audrey was soaked. She changed into some rags and took her clothes and some of Rebecca's things out into the rain. That's how they did their laundry. After the rain, Audrey rubbed the clothes a little, wrung them out, and hung them on a rope. Well, let's eat, rejoiced the girl. I bought sausage today. They had a supper, and the child began to learn new verses, and again night came to their dwelling. Today Audrey did not feel like talking, and she fell fast asleep. Rebecca, as usual, could not sleep for a long time. During the day she rarely thought about her parents. She often had inspiration at this time, and the girl used to write. But when night came she suffered from loneliness, from what had happened to them. I don't know whether it is the result of birth trauma or a doctor's mistake, but the girl has improper impulse transmission to the retina, the doctor said when he was asked why Audrey had visual problems. Unfortunately, this can only be solved by surgery. I agree, the father rejoiced. I'll pay for the surgery. Just help her see properly. It's not so simple. She should be at least five years old, the doctor looked at him. It's impossible to do the operation sooner. Five years? The father said in shock. Oh, my God! So we have to wait more than three years? Audrey had been almost blind since birth because of a complicated birth and the death of his wife. Their father, Bernard, devoted all his time and attention to his daughters. From his youth, he turned out to be a smart guy. He was first an assistant master for repairing household appliances. Then he mastered electronics and opened his own small business. A few years later, he bought a house in a suburb. By this time, he had already been married, and his daughter Rebecca was a pupil. They did not live richly, but not poorly either. They had everything they needed. To the great amazement of her parents, Rebecca discovered a talent in her early childhood, and they encouraged it in every possible way. When she was fourteen, her mother became pregnant again. It was an event the whole family had all been waiting for a very long time. Rebecca dedicated poems to her little sister all the time. I wish I could turn back time, Rebecca whispered through her tears. Daddy, Mummy, I love you so much. It began to rain and the girl finally fell asleep. She often had the same dream, standing alone on a bridge. Suddenly, someone called out to her. She turned around and saw her parents walking towards her. Rebecca, come on, stop it. Her mother wiped her tears. Unfortunately, we can't stay with you for now, but you won't be alone. We will send our good friends to you. They will help you. Mum, please don't leave us, screamed the girl as her parents began to disappear. I love you so much. Your love will come back to you, daughter, came her father's voice. I know he's a good man. He'll take care of you. I've already told him that. Daddy, Rebecca ran after the ghosts. Who is he? The girl woke up and wiped the sweat from her face. Rebecca had had this dream so many times before. But each time she had strong feelings. Audrey, she pronounced, have you got up already? I'm here, Rebecca, came the child's voice. I thought I'd clean up while you were still asleep. I'll put the tea on now. Audrey, I beg you, said the sister. If you feel the rain starting, hide at once. Stay at home today. Let's take today off. Rebecca, don't worry, I'm fine. The little girl brushed her sister's arm. I'll rest in the fall and winter, and while the weather is nice, we have to work. Audrey, despite her age, was more pragmatic than her older sister. She had little hope of a miracle. She realized that if they managed to raise the money for the operation, then they would finally get out of here. That was her fondest dream. Rebecca, I'm off, shouted the girl and tapped her stick on the wall. Today was Sunday, and Audrey was having a pretty good day. 
She could feel people standing near her, and someone kept coming up and throwing coins into her box. By lunchtime, it was very hot, and people had dispersed. The girl sat down beneath the monument. Suddenly, she felt something soft. "'Is it you, Archie?' said Audrey, and stroked the stray dog. "'You've been gone a long time. Have you been busy?' Archie barked happily, answering her yes. Then he put his paws on the girl's hands and nuzzled her. The girl stroked him lovingly. "'You're such a hard worker,' laughed the girl. "'Of course you didn't have time for me. You and your buddies have been running around the junkyards, haven't you?' The dog stood near Audrey for a while longer, barked and ran away. Archie had never asked her for a treat. Probably the dog knew that the girl's life wasn't much different from his. Only she had one big disadvantage compared to Archie. She couldn't see very well, and most of the time she literally couldn't see at all. "'Today Archie came running,' Audrey said cheerfully to Rebecca when she got home. "'Well, how's he doing?' her older sister laughed. "'Probably he's been out with his buddies.' "'Unfortunately, he didn't answer that question for me,' Audrey laughed. "'He always keeps quiet when I ask him that. "'Now I shouldn't expect him back before a week from now.' "'Rebecca took the whole day today, away from thoughts of the past, "'but by nightfall they still caught up with even greater force. "'Dad, someone's here,' she said, looking out the window. "'There's some kind of car parked near us.' "'I'll go and see,' her father replied, and threw on his full jacket.' Rebecca looked out the window. She saw a woman hugging her father. He put her arm around her and stroked her head. Five minutes later, they walked into the house together. Rebecca, meet your distant relative. The father introduced the guest. You can call her Aunt Krista. She has some serious problems right now, so she'll live with us for a while. The girl didn't like this relative right away. The aunt had a fake squeaky voice and hid her smoking habit from Rebecca's father. She only treated the girls well in the presence of their father, but when he was away, Aunt Krista would yell at the children and even swing her fists at them. After a few months, Rebecca realised that Aunt Krista wasn't going anywhere. "'Dad, I can't continue like this,' she screamed. "'Either she leaves our house or I do.' "'Rebecca, darling, just one more month,' her father pleaded. "'She'll have her own place in a month. She's already submitted all the necessary documents.' Rebecca was almost 19 years old at the time, and she sensed that something was off about this situation. Aunt Krista claimed that her house had been seized for non-payment of the loan. She said that she couldn't find the money right away, and now she had to wait a few more weeks for her case to be resolved. "'Dad, one month and that's it,' Rebecca said angrily. "'She treats Audrey badly and behaves herself like at her own home.' One day in early December... Aunt Krista left in the evening without saying anything to anyone and did not return until the next morning. That day, Audrey was scheduled to be hospitalised for an operation and everyone was anxious. Where could she be? Bernard worried. We need to get to the hospital. Dad, forget about her, Rebecca replied. Let's hurry or we'll be late. They gathered their belongings and got into the car. The road was icy from the rain that had turned into snow overnight and froze everything in the morning. Father drove cautiously. Oh, damn, I'm moving like a turtle, he cursed. We're definitely going to be late, he added, annoyed and accelerated. They had already travelled about three kilometres when they saw a small downhill slope ahead. Due to the ice, Father tried to slow down, but he couldn't. He applied the brakes, but they didn't work. Bernard tried to stop the car, but the speed only increased, and their car became uncontrollable. Rebecca couldn't remember what happened next. She felt a strong impact and pain in her spine. Her father died instantly. Rebecca and Audrey were taken to the hospital. The little girl's arm was broken and her older sister was seriously injured. Two months later, they were discharged from the hospital and returned home. Just as they were recovering from the shock of their father's death, their lives turned into a living nightmare. Aunt Krista took custody of Audrey she took all the money, neglected to feed the girls, and refused to clean up after them. Under the stress, Audrey's eyesight worsened, and her eye surgery was postponed. She also took away all the money Bernard had saved for Audrey to pay for any additional expenses for her treatment. "'God forbid! If you complain to anyone, you'll end up like your father!' Krista hissed at bedridden Rebecca. 
I'm in charge here now. Rebecca and Audrey stayed with her until April. Then one day, Aunt Krista entered the girls' room. The notary is coming today, she said, looking at them angrily. We're going to transfer the house to my name. You'll have to sign a waiver. I won't sign anything, Rebecca said loudly. This is our house, and you have nothing to do with it. Oh, is that so? The woman's eyes narrowed. Then I'll send Audrey to an orphanage and then poison you. You wouldn't dare, the girl screamed. You'll go to jail for that. Fool, they haven't put me in jail for your father yet, she laughed. It was only now that Rebecca fully realised the true cause of the tragedy. She quickly understood that this woman was capable of anything. Fine, she finally said. But if you do anything bad to me or Audrey, you will be in trouble. Are you threatening me? Aunt Krista's eyes turned bloodshot. I'll strangle you with my own hands right now. Rebecca didn't know how this would have ended if the woman's cell phone hadn't rung. Get ready, the notary is here. She shouted and left the room. That day, the girl signed all the documents. In the middle of the night, she was awakened by some people. She and Audrey were forcefully placed in a car and driven away for a long time. Eventually, they were unceremoniously dumped on the doorstep of the abandoned house where they had been living for three years. Aunt Krista received all their belongings as well as the money from the state that was meant for Rebecca and Audrey. Rebecca stirred, her face drenched in tears. She had been unable to sleep that night. Audrey, her sister said the next morning, I have a strange premonition. Something good is going to happen, rejoiced the girl. You're rarely wrong. Maybe I'll make a lot of money today. I don't know, she replied, but I can feel that something good will happen. Audrey was in a good mood that day, and she recited poetry from the bottom of her heart. People thanked her, put the money in her pockets and box. The girl was going to return home early today. She and Rebecca decided that first she would bring the money home, and only after Rebecca counted the proceeds, the girl would go to the store. The older sister guessed that Audrey was being cheated all the time, and it hurt her a lot. Audrey worked so hard to earn that money, and the greedy adults were just stealing it from her. Audrey arrived home, and not five minutes later, a man's voice was heard outside. "'Is anyone here?' Dave asked as he entered the courtyard of the half-destroyed house. "'Audrey, where are you? Are you home?' There was no answer, so the man carefully looked around the old house. It was empty inside and it was dangerous to stay there, as the ceiling could collapse at any moment. He was about to leave when he noticed the basement. He cautiously opened the door. "'Audrey, are you here?' he called out. It was dark downstairs, so he turned on the flashlight on his phone and climbed down the steps. The presence of a small rug indicated that someone must have once lived there. Audrey, don't be afraid, it's me. Do you remember me and my friends? We wanted to help you, Dave said loudly. The man walked a little further and entered a room. It was silent, but as he looked closely through the darkness, he noticed some movement under some rags. Audrey, don't be afraid. I swear to God I won't do anything bad to you. I want to help you. Please let me talk to you the man said desperately. A woman's head appeared from under the rags. She had a frightened expression. Who are you? Dave asked in surprise. I'm sorry, I'm looking for Audrey. Maybe you know where she is? What do you want? The young woman asked through tears. What do you want from her? You see, my friends and I gave her some money the other day, Dave began, but I didn't consider the possibility that she might have been held by bad people. I don't care about the money, but I wanted to help the child. Do you know if she has any relatives? You can take your money. We don't need it, the woman said proudly. But you won't see Audrey. Leave us alone. Go away. All right, I'll leave. But please tell me, why are you here? Is someone forcing you to stay here? The man asked excitedly. No, the woman replied briefly. Please don't come here. Dave turned around and walked out of the basement. He was so amazed by what he saw that he could barely make it to his car. Who is this woman or girl, he thought. Is she a relative or her mother? How do they even live there? Tears flowed down his cheeks. Dave was not usually sentimental, but what he saw had deeply affected him. Okay, I have to calm down, and then I'll come back here again. 
After a few days, the man regained his composure. He was eager to know what had happened to them, and came to the square again. Audrey, hello, it's me, he said softly. Do you remember me? How are you doing? The girl shuddered and quickly stood up, unsure of what to do. Please don't be afraid of me, Dave said calmly. I don't want anything from you. I want to help you. What happened to you? Our parents died and we were kicked out of our house. The girl lowered her head. So what do you want from us? We don't want your money. We haven't even touched it. Have you really not spent a penny? He marveled. Audrey shook her head, indicating a negative response. It was evident that the girl was telling the truth. Wow! Dave exclaimed, wiping his face. I'm completely shocked. We don't need your money, she replied. We'll manage on our own. Audrey, it's not about money at all, he said. I just want to help you. Then take your money, the girl suddenly said, and we can be friends. Dave was unprepared for this turn of events. He was simply amazed. We don't need money to be friends, Audrey added. I agree, the man finally said. For the sake of our friendship, I am ready to take my money, but you must give me your word. What word? the child wondered. You want me to do something? If we are friends now, will you let me visit and give you gifts? It's a deal, she said, extending her hand. Now we are friends, and we will fulfill our obligations faithfully. Audrey happily walked back home. She heard her new friend walking to her left. They had agreed that today Dave would pick up his money. Audrey, let me get something for tea, Dave asked the girl. She cheerfully nodded at him. They entered the local store. Seeing the girl accompanied by a respectable man, the saleswoman, who often underpaid the girl's change, perked up. Good afternoon, she said cheerfully. You must be a relative of this girl. I help her so often. If you need anything, come by. We're always glad to see you. She seems strange today, the child said in surprise. She never even said hello to me. At first, she even kicked me out of the store, but then she started serving me. Well, you see what a good friend I am, Dave laughed. With me, you won't have any more problems. I'll go in first, Audrey requested when they approached her dwelling. I'll explain everything to Rebecca, and then I'll call you. The girl left and was gone for a very long time. Dave was about to enter without an invitation, but then the cellar door opened and Audrey appeared. Let's go. I told her everything, said the girl contentedly. She is no longer afraid of you. Dave entered a room that was already familiar to him. The girl was sitting with her back to the window, writing something on a piece of paper. Hello, Dave greeted. I apologize for coming uninvited. And if I die today, Rebecca wrote in her dictation. Wait a minute. Inspiration struck her, whispered Audrey. So she has to write down her poems. So it's her poems that you've been reading in the square, he exclaimed excitedly. Oh my goodness, it's difficult to believe. Uh-huh, Audrey replied quietly and tapping her stick lightly, walked towards the old table. Hello, the young woman suddenly said. Audrey has told me everything. Take your money, you can even count it. We didn't take anything. Honestly, we don't even know how much is there. Haven't you even counted it? Dave said in shock. There were a hundred thousands there. I thought perhaps it would be enough for you to rent a more suitable dwelling than that. Maybe I'll leave the money to you after all. Well, no, we don't need that kind of money. And besides, money can't buy friendship, Audrey chimed in. I'm sorry we don't have the best conditions, but if you like, we can have tea. Thanks, but I need to go, Dave replied and wanted to say goodbye. Can I visit you? Of course you can, Audrey said cheerfully. Rebecca, do you mind? The young woman was embarrassed and didn't know what to say to her sister. Rebecca, I'd like to read your poems, Dave suddenly asked her, if you don't mind. Rebecca nodded in agreement. See you soon. By the way, my name is Dave. Sorry I forgot to introduce myself, the man said and went away. Audrey, what was that? Rebecca said in shock when the man left. Who is he? I don't know. The girl shrugged. But he's so warm. I believe him, Rebecca. I'm so scared. I'm afraid I'm wrong, the older sister said excitedly. Rebecca, let's start trusting people again, shall we? Audrey replied maturely. 
Dave began visiting the sisters. Dirt and poverty didn't disgust him. His new acquaintances became so dear to him that he began to perceive them as an integral part of his life. Well, how's it going with our bet? Khalil asked his friend. You have one week left. Khalil? James? I lost on the same day. Dave smiled enigmatically. What do you mean? James said in amazement. Hasn't she spent all the money yet? They gave me back every penny in just a few days, he said contentedly. They? the friends asked in unison. Are there a lot of them? They are Audrey and her older sister, replied the man calmly. The poem the girl reads is written by her older sister. Unfortunately, she can't walk. Her legs are paralysed. What a thing! James scratched his head. Did they really not spend a penny? Yes, Dave said. I was shocked myself. Audrey offered me true friendship in exchange for my money, and I agreed. And I don't regret it one bit. I'm real friends with them, just like I am with you. And how old is the eldest? Khalil said with interest. Judging by your shining eyes, there's probably more than just friendship there. She's a little over twenty, Dave blushed, but as pure as the blue sky. Well, it's all clear with you, James sobbed. Probably she's the best girl in the world. Well, I mean to you. Yes, Dave replied briefly. I think I've fallen in love with her, and for a long time, maybe forever. Hallelujah! Khalil raised his hands in the air. Did it really happen? Guys, I don't know what to do, Dave said suddenly. How do I get them out of the basement? They just might not agree. What happened to them anyway? James asked excitedly. Their mother died during childbirth. The girl suffered a birth trauma and has been visually impaired since birth. She was not allowed to have surgery until she turned five years old. However, by that time, her father's half-sister had moved into the house. Or rather, she was nobody at all to him. His mother married an alcoholic like her, and then he revealed that he had a daughter, Krista. For years, that daughter lived her life. When her house was foreclosed, she remembered that she once had a so-called brother. From what I understand, this woman staged an accident and tampered with the brakes of the girl's father's car. The man died on the spot. I think she expected to inherit everything after the death of all the family, since she was the only one, albeit very distant, claimant. However, it didn't work out, so Aunt Krista made Rebecca sign a waiver for all the property, threatening to poison her and put Audrey in an orphanage. Oh my goodness, is that really possible? James exclaimed. It's like watching a thriller. Why wasn't she put in jail? It's obvious. James, they didn't want to deal with it, Khalil sighed. They simply wrote that the brakes failed due to technical reasons during the trip. Do you know how many cases like this happen? They only investigate when the person involved is famous or there's money involved, or when relatives constantly hound them. Well, Dave, James sighed, shall we take them away? I'll ask Dr. Callan to examine the girls. If they don't want to live with you, we'll find them a simple apartment. You should be accurate with them, otherwise they'll run away from you. It's not easy to return the victims to normal. Talk to Rebecca, James suggested. Tell her everything as it is. If she also cares about Audrey, she will agree. Yes, you're right. By the way, I lost the bet and I have to get married in a month, the man said calmly. If anyone will be my wife, it will be Rebecca. With Nicole, I want to finally break off the relationship. Frankly, I'm fed up with her. Yes, that's the right decision to leave that gold digger, Khalil replied angrily. That woman is cunning. Khalil, I don't care about her. His friend waved his hand. I need to think about Audrey and Rebecca. By the way, have you told your parents anything yet? James asked curiously. Yes, I talked to them yesterday, Dave answered. My dad is shocked, of course, but he doesn't mind. Mum, in general, wants to take them in. The friends agreed that in a few days, Dave would offer his help and a new place to live to Rebecca and Audrey. That day, the man was very excited. Dave, I'm so happy they've come, Audrey shouted joyfully upon hearing his voice. Rebecca is waiting for you. She's written a beautiful poem about you. Dave felt very embarrassed this time. 
He didn't know how to explain everything. He lacked the courage, and after half an hour, he left. What an idiot! He scolded himself getting in his car. I'm such a coward! I can't even look at her, and my friends call me an experienced hunter. Engrossed in his thoughts, he didn't notice that someone was watching him closely from afar. What was he doing there? Nicole asked herself in amazement. It's so creepy. Is he mingling with the homeless? When Dave's car drove away, Nicole cautiously entered the basement. What the hell? It stinks in here, she snorted. Is someone living here? A flashlight illuminated her way and she entered the far room. Who are you? she asked impudently when she saw a young woman and the child. I'm sorry, but what are you doing here? Rebecca asked in amazement. Could Dave really stoop so low? Nicole shouted in disgust. Is he sleeping with a beggar? Who are you? Rebecca said loudly. And I'm asking you again, what are you doing here? I am Dave's wife, she declared angrily. And now I know who he's cheating on me with. There was and is nothing between us, Rebecca said proudly. Go away. Do you know who I am? Nicole shouted angrily. I'll throw you out of here today. Do you really think Dave will fall for someone like you? Don't be ridiculous. I've put so much effort into him, so don't expect me to give him to anyone. You speak of him as if he were a thing, Rebecca said in astonishment. What do you know about his life? yelled the stranger in a frenzy. He's mine, and I'm not giving his money to anyone. I think I understand what this is about, Rebecca said calmly. This isn't about Dave at all. You don't care about him. You want his money. Yes, I don't care about him. He's just a lame dog in my hands. As for you, I'm going to destroy you. That's enough, Nicole. Dave came out of the next room. You've already said enough. Go away. Dave, my love! Nicole coquettishly approached the man, trying to fix the situation. I love you so much. Get out of here, Dave shouted at the top of his voice. I don't want to ever see you again in my life. It turned out that after driving a few kilometres, Dave decided to go back and talk to Rebecca. Hearing the quarrel, he was watching the scene unnoticeably. Two years passed. Come on, sit down. Dave's father invited the guests to the table. My favourite friends, it's been so long since we've seen each other. Let's remember what happened during this time and celebrate together. There was a huge table outside and the guests began to sit down. It was June and the evening brought a slight chill. Khalil, Lillian, let's start with you, friends. Dave's father said loudly, we congratulate you from the bottom of our hearts on your triplets. What you've done is a miracle. James, there's just one little push left, and you will have your personal football team. Dave burst into laughter. For God's sake, please tape your son's mouth shut, Khalil said pleadingly to Dave's father. Julie, James, continued the elderly man, you are such a hero. On the fourth attempt at IVH, but you did it. Guys, from the bottom of my heart, I congratulate you on your twins. Everyone looked at the double stroller where the infants peacefully slept, undisturbed by any cries or noise. Our daughters all look like their daddy. Really? My darling, Julie said affectionately to her husband. Now about you, my dear Dave and Rebecca. The elderly father couldn't hold back his emotions and cried. How long... I have been waiting for this moment. I've never imagined that one day someone would call me grandfather. But in a month, I will be cradling my first grandchild. Rebecca gently stroked her belly and kissed her husband. Unfortunately, she still had a limp in one leg from the surgery and walked with a stick, but it did not affect the baby in any way. But that's not all. After taking a sip of water, the master of the house continued... Friends, one of the best publications in our country has published a book with Rebecca's poems. My girl, they are outstanding. The man approached his daughter-in-law and kissed her hand in appreciation. All the best things I've written have come after meeting Dave, she said. 
He is both my inspiration and my guiding star. And finally, Dave's father said after a brief silence, Excuse me, I can't help but praise myself. Audrey, come here. The girl was playing with Khalil's children and quickly ran up to the adults. So, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to present the winner of the junior golf competition, he proudly announced. Audrey took second place. She is my hope and joy. I have never met such a talented child. To achieve such a result in just a year, she has already beaten me several times. Audrey doesn't just love golf. She adores you too, Rebecca laughed. If only you knew how she prepares for your lessons. In those two years, the girl had undergone three surgeries to restore her eyesight, and the doctors were waiting until she turned fifteen to observe her during her teenage years. Only then could they say that Audrey was completely cured. Dave was looking at everyone with joyful eyes. He had already become so accustomed to his new life that he no longer understood how he had lived before. Who would have thought that because of our stupid bet my fate was decided? He thought, back then I was like an arrogant boy who looked down on ordinary people. I believed that money made all the difference, but I'm so glad I was able to change. Now I have a long-awaited family, and most importantly, I realized that I am capable of true love. <laughs>